Hi, everybody. Good evening. Hi. So wonderful to see this full room. Yay. So I'm, um, I'm Professor Keith Feldman. I'm the chair in ethnic studies here at UC Berkeley. Um, and this is, couldn't be the more perfect day for an event like this. Um, uh, our department was born, as you know, out of student-led strikes to transform the university, to make it matter in a different and better and more livable way. And so to have a conversation 50 some years on about what that looks like today, especially with, um, with high school teachers and educators who have been doing some really incredible work in the classroom, in our high school classrooms around ethnic studies, couldn't be, could, we couldn't have asked for, for better timing. So uh, I'm really pleased that, that y'all are here. Um, I really want to thank um, folks in the American Culture Center for making this possible, um, and as well as staff in uh, the beautiful Ethnic Studies Department, um, and Styles Hall for coming, coming in at the last minute to create a really wonderful space for us. As you might know, Styles Hall has long been the spot just off campus for really important, impactful conversations. So um, I'm glad y'all have some food, get nourished. Um, we have a jam-packed um, uh, evening event ahead of us, so I'm gonna pass it to Victoria to, um, to get us into the details. Hey everyone, so um, the PS of the Resistance was some great slides that were here for the first half an hour that we were setting up and then suddenly went blank. So hopefully that those will come up. Um, echoing Keith's uh, thanks to everybody involved in putting together, putting today together, uh, Dewey at the back in particular and Doug. Um, and of course, centrally to our ethnic studies teachers and administrators who are here with us today. It is an epic moment in our history to be rolling out K through 12 graduation requirement. And I'm gonna just, um, mimic something that Jason Munoz, who's involved with me in the High School Ethnic Studies Initiative, Par Initiative Partnership at UC Berkeley, along with, with Keith, is that Jason said, you know, we don't want to wait two more generations for this. It might be uh, imperfect, but we have to get going and use this moment right now. Um, and so you in this room, I don't think, as a teacher of ethnic studies, there is any more powerful and political space than the classroom. You can change lives, change futures, change histories with the classroom. And so it's so wonderful to see you here and thinking that that classroom space might be yours. And so with that said, I'm so grateful for Joe Amy, Chrissy, and Jason, and Hasmig uh, for being with us tonight. You will offer a lot of questions when you respond to the Google form. So with introductions made, we're actually going to start to, they're going to choose a question and go from there and then really open into a discussion with you. Um, Joy, we haven't got the slides back up yet. <laughs> That's so okay. if you could go ahead and <clears throat> sure. just introduce yourself first. Yeah, my name is Joemi Ito Gates. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am an ethnic studies teacher and special assignment for Berkeley Unified School District. Um, this is my 19th year in the school district. My background is not high school at all. I am an elementary school teacher through and through, mostly second and third grade. And that's my passion are the little ones. I'm also a mother uh, to a first grader at a school in Berkeley Unified School District. Um, so I have a real personal stake in this work and bringing ethnic studies TK-12 to our school district. Uh, we already have it at the high school level. Um, I know Hasmig will speak um, more about that. And my job, my role as the TSA for Ethnic Studies is to help bring it to our elementary schools and our middle schools and to imagine how it could perhaps expand and deepen and grow at the high school level. Um, <clears throat> something else about me is um, I kind of always was really passionate about social justice and came into this work sort of in a sideways door. Um, not necessarily through the classroom. 
So when I entered into teaching, um, I was on my own personal journey around um, really deepening my own self discovery and understanding of my identity as a multiracial um, Japanese American woman. And so I started a summer program called Fusion Camp for um, multiracial children of color and transracially raised youth of color. And it was arts based, started in San Francisco, then came to Oakland. Um, so that was re really where I started um, getting into this kind of ethnic studies world was through a summer camp experience outside of the classroom um, because that to me felt more liberatory. And then I became a classroom teacher and started bringing that into my classroom. And then that summer program turned into an after school club. Um, so that's a little bit about um, my work and how I kind of came into the space of ethnic studies. And um, I'll just pass along and then share more as we get going. Hi, my name is Chrissy Emmons. I apologize for my voice, um, feeling laryngitis, but I could not miss today because I see so many of you guys, and I think back to myself, 21 years ago, I was in your guys' seat, um, class of 2001, ethnic studies major. So <laughs> I was very happy to come back here. Thank you, Dewey, for helping me out, <laughs> help me graduate. Um, You're not that old, are you, Dewey? I mean, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so in coming into ethnic studies, um, probably a lot of familiar stories of like, you know, I didn't learn anything about me, me, you know, grade school, high school, and it probably did, it took taking um, people of mixed race descent. I don't know if that's still here on campus, um, but I took that class here and I was like, wow, there are people like me. Um, I'm, you know, Chinese and Mexican. And so being around others who were mixed, I was like, wow, there's a space for us. Um, and not so much just literally a physical space to have a class, but to have conversations about identity. That was something that I struggled with, you know, racial identity, to be more specific, racial identity, because I didn't know where I fit in. And that kind of just stuck with me even into, even after graduating. Uh, I, um, right after graduation, I went right into a credentialing program at San Francisco State. I knew I only wanted to do middle school and I've only done middle school. I'm going on, I think, year 22 in middle school. Love the age. They test you. You're going to love it. Um, and I, was, I, I taught U.S. history for quite some time, but having that ethnic studies lens, like from day one, I barely touched any of our textbooks, like district textbooks, right? I barely touched them because I was like, you know what, That's, it doesn't teach us anything, right? Some of the textbooks that we use were from when I was back in eighth grade. And I was like, mm, we're not going to do that, right? So I literally took a lot of my um, textbooks from, from here at Cal. And I was like, how do I teach Zen? Not the new young readers edition, right? But the fat, small print Zen. How am I going to take teach Columbus to my kids, right? I didn't change it. I literally just copied out chapters and I had the, the kids read. And it just like, I was like, wow, like they, they want to learn this, you know? And I think from that point on, you know, with my first year of teaching and just even to taking it today, that there's so many different ways to bring stories and perspectives into our traditional classrooms. And I think with the new adoption or the requirement when it hit, like it almost felt like I found my purpose in life, right? It's like, this sounds crazy to say, but like I actually can really do something with my degree, right? I can work and help you know, others who may not have that perspective or experience and help them, you know, transform, you know, how they think they're thinking on things, and not just in history, right? But in different content um, areas. Um, so um, last year, piloted the first ethnic studies class for our district um, at our in eighth grade middle school, not realizing that our district, Castro Valley Unified, was wanting to jump on it. So now this year, we're at both middle schools. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't leave the classroom. I was like, I started this. I'm not going to leave the classroom. So as much as I wanted to be a full-time teacher on special assignment, I was like, no, I'm still going to teach this class and be a teacher on special assignment working with our sixth grade um, identity class, but also working with the high school teachers as they are embarking on this really tough but exciting journey of developing their curriculum. Um, so I know I said a lot. Um, I'll be able to answer <laughs> that's fine thing, but I'm going to go and pass them on to Jason. Thank you. Um, my name is Jason Muniz, and I am 
an academic coordinator and associate director of the Berkeley History Project. Um, and that doesn't mean a whole lot to anybody who doesn't understand how I got to that position or how I got to this <coughs> seat. Um, before I worked at UC Berkeley and, and the capacity that I work here now is I go to a lot of different schools all over the Bay Area and support their teachers, specifically in the history department, with history instruction. And initially that looked like, oh, well, help us with our, 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 our creating a more thoughtful like a world history and, and U.S. history and gov courses. But the, the real subtext of, of my being hired to work at this department um, was to make sure that we would be able to support the oncoming um, need for ethnic studies to be taught in high schools. And I was specifically asked to do that because I spent uh, years in the classroom in East Oakland at Fremont High School teaching ethnic studies in that community. Um, that's what brought me to this space right here. It's the, the having been there when in a classroom, in a regular high school classroom, such as that, that could be a regular one, where there was no ethnic studies in this school and now there needs to be some now. And how do you make something from nothing that has never been there before in this classroom space? So I was part of a, a team in Oakland in 2015. Y'all were in school then. Um, or, and places, like even if you were in places similar to Oakland, places not similar to Oakland, all taking on that challenge of how do we make this course for these places? And um, just working out the, the, the challenges and the benefits and the experience of, of doing that um, was part of that work and building that from the ground up. For me, I, I came to work in a, the classroom in a very non-traditional way. Um, I was not an education major. This was a third career for me. Um, when I went to, to high school, I went to college, the last thing I wanted to do was be a teacher. I couldn't think of anything I wanted to do less because both my parents were teachers. Could the, the, the last thing I wanted. Um, but um, fates conspired to, to have, me, have me have to try it for a little while to be able to make ends meet. And it was one of those annoying moments when you realize that your parents are right. <laughs> So um, yeah, they were right, and cuts all these years later, and I support other teachers to be teachers. And um, it, it, it's no longer a, a work for me, it's like the calling for me, and I, this gets to be something that I do as opposed to something that I have to do. So um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, lot of, a lot of interesting stories to get to this spot and a lot of interesting experiences trying to do this work and now bring ethnic studies to a lot of places where, um, frankly, it's needed, which is everywhere. So um, it looks, different to try and do this work in a lot of different spaces, and, and that's some of the problems that um, we're confronting with my project. Um, we're working um, with this HSESI project, High School Ethnic Studies Initiative project, really to start to, to sort of cultivate the resources that are needed to help all the teachers who, who are like me, who never took an ethnic studies course until they had to take something along with ethnic studies, but um, need to teach it now. I was super lucky because my parents were both educators and I did learn all those. I, I learned the Columbus BS story when I was a little kid. They weren't going to let that happen as, as like educator parents, right? But um, I go into classrooms where they're still saying that, that and, and you know, you're, the, you're recoiling in hard. It's like, you're just really saying this thing that... So, um, yeah, you, you know the gravity and the weight of what you're trying to do if you have just a, a little bit of perspective. I think the folks in this place do and um, it's a mission in front of you to be able to take on some of this work, and I, I welcome you to it. Thanks. Um, hi, good evening. I also am losing my voice. It seems to be going around. Um, if I cough a bunch, I promise I'm not contagious, but I have that like, deadly cold that everybody's, I don't know if all your schools are getting it, but our school is, it's not COVID anymore, but it's something. Anyway, so excuse the voice and excuse the coughing if it happens. Um, my name is Hasmi Manassian. I'm a teacher at uh, Berkeley High School, just up the road. Um, I've been there for, this is my 22nd year at Berkeley High. Uh, I went into teaching to teach at Berkeley High. Um, and so that's the whole story all by itself. But I was just really motivated and inspired by the community that I migrated to from Southern California. Um, I am originally, I was born in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, where Lebanese uh, culturally, ethnically Armenian, and that matters because representation matters, and, and that's one of the big things we try to teach kids in ethnic studies. Um, so my family immigrated here in 1978, grew up in Southern California um, in Orange County. Uh, I was brown in Orange County, um, about as brown, like it was so white I was brown, that's the joke. Um, people couldn't figure out what I was, so everyone thought I was Mexican, which was fun because my wife's Mexican, so 
I'm like, oh, it was just a, it was just a premonition of your future <laughs> life. Um, and, uh, and then I went to school at UC San Diego. I did my undergrad in political science with a minor in ethnic studies. And then I came up here. I did my graduate work at Mills College. Um, uh, I did my education credential there, my teacher credential, and my master's in education there. Uh, and then out of the gate at 24 years old, I started teaching at Berkeley High, and I haven't left. Um, so Mills taught us that teaching is a political act. I think you mentioned that, and that's exactly what it is. There is nothing apolitical about this work. So the first thing you should know if you want to go into teaching is that it is political, and you are political by doing it, even if you haven't considered yourself a political person. Um, I teach ethnic studies to ninth graders at Berkeley High. Uh, at Berkeley High, shortly after UC Berkeley and San Francisco State had their ethnic studies movement, uh, Berkeley High had their own ethnic studies movement and built an African American studies department. Um, the first and maybe the only African American studies department in the nation in a high school. And from that department, our ethnic studies requirement was born. Um, and so we actually have had, like you guys, an ethnic studies, it's still a requirement at Cal, yeah? An ethnic studies requirement? Um, no? <laughs> well, well, we teach that it is, so if that's changed, i got to revise my curriculum. But we always tell the kids, like, it's required, you know, we do a lot of, like, talk about UC Berkeley and SF State sort of movement for ethnic studies, and they learn a lot about the history of why they're in the class and why we take ethnic studies and how special they should feel. <coughs> We did all that before the state required it, and now that the state has required it, that's only kind of bolstered our position. Um, but we, at, at, uh, the way it works at Berkeley High is that there's a, a universal, what we call the universal ninth grade, so every student comes into Berkeley High taking four core classes, and ethnic studies is one of those core classes. It is a graduation requirement, which means if you come into Berkeley High as a sophomore, junior, or senior, you will still have to take an ethnic studies class to graduate. Um, we have our introductory ethnic studies class, which is the one that I teach, and then we have a series of courses that you can take in 10th, 11th, and 12th under our African American Studies Department, our Chicano Latino Studies Department, and our Asian American uh, Studies, which is not a department per se, but it, it holds now. Two classes join me? Is it two or three? Do you know? The Asian, uh, our Asian, we it's have one, one lit. It's an AAPI lit class, it's and just then the, lit. the hope is to also have an AAPI history yeah. class. And I'll just say that when I got to Berkeley High in 2001, 2001 um, we had an Asian history class, we had LGBT class, we had a women's studies class. We ha I mean, it was almost, we've kind of gone backwards actually, that we're like trying to get those classes back mm -hmm. because we lost a lot of them in the, in the f sort of, you know, standardized testing wars and it's a whole other story. But, um, all that is to say, I'm teaching in a community that's incredibly supportive of ethnic studies. And, um, uh, you know, a lot of your questions, and we're going to let some folks address, so a lot of your questions were about the pushback and the tension around ethnic studies. And in this, relative to the rest of California, relative to the Bay Area, to the California, and actually the country, we're not getting the same pushback locally for ethnic studies that I think a lot of other schools are getting. Um, we're also a very established program. It's required for graduation. So if families have issues with it, they generally deal with that in their own, you know, backyard barbecues, less so with us <laughs> directly as teachers, right? Um, I want to answer maybe one of the questions and then we can kind of go. Is that, does that make sense? Do you want to say the question? Husband? Yeah. And maybe the person who's in the room can kind of put their hand up. So yeah. That was my question. And if you want to add anything. Sure. Perhaps. So, um, First of all, how many of you in this room are interested in becoming a teacher, a classroom teacher? Raise your hand if that's something you're considering. Nice. Okay. And the rest of you are like, well, what am I going to do with my ethnic studies degree? <laughs> um, it, it's hard, right? I mean, when you're an undergrad, especially, and you're trying to figure out, like, what to do with your degree. You know, I went and became a waitress with my political science degree. It was really, I mean, that's whatever, you know, there's like, it takes a long road. If you don't know exactly what you want to do right now, don't sweat it. Um, it's just that everyone has their own journey to their calling, like you were saying. Teaching definitely is. So the question, uh, what does a typical workday look like for you? How have students responded to the curriculum you teach? What makes teaching ethnic studies different from teaching other subjects? And what advice would you give to new ethnic studies teachers? Um, and does anybody remember asking that question? Okay, well, I can tackle it. 
Um, so a typical work day is very atypical. Um, the, there are no two days are alike in a school environment. I think we can all agree to that. I think it's also really funny. You guys, you guys collected quite a group here because Joami's like, I love elementary school. Like those are my people, and you're like middle school. Like that's my jam. And I'm sitting here going, Oh no way! <laughs> elementary and middle. I was like, absolutely get me out of there. High school all the way. And you're a high school person too, right? Absolutely. I mean, you're like one or the other. It's very hard to be all three. Um, so there's not a real a typical day, but I, I guess. Um, you know, uh, a typical, you know, you go into your classroom. I guess one of these things that's reminded me is if people ever want to visit Berkeley High, we are just down the street. So if anyone's interested in just doing like a shadow day where you want to just come into an ethnic studies classroom, we have 28 sections of ethnic studies at Berkeley High. I'm sure I could squeeze you into one of them. Um, so, uh, yeah, a typical day I would say is like... Um, you go into school, you know, you walk into the building, you do a lot of greeting of the adults, you're immediately immersed in kids. You're doing four or five live shows a day. That's essentially what it is, right? You're like a you're a live, you're you're an actor or an actress, right? And you're most authentic self, but that is what you're doing. You're performing uh, to a certain degree. So you lose your voice in a typical day. Uh, you're grateful for really high quality shoes in a typical day because your feet get tired. Um, and really, you're constantly connecting. So it's it's a ton of connections, just hundreds and hundreds of connections in a typical day, right? So like you have a plan. I'm going to hand out the warm ups. The warm ups going to be on the side. The kids are going to come in. They're going to put their phones away. Like you have a plan. Your typical day has a structure, and then and then it changes, right? A kid comes in. Oh my God, I love my phone in the other room. Can I go? And then you know, so your typical day is handling a lot of little interactions. Um, while holding a space, like a calm, centered, you know, like I know what I'm doing space for the intellectual work that's happening in your classroom. And so it's really a dance. It's a constant dance between those two things. Um, waitressing was a really good training for teaching. Because you really just had to know, you had to hold like the big picture in mind all the time and also remember that table number three, ask for water without ice. Right, like you have to, you're constantly doing those those two things. Um, I think ethnic studies is different. I taught a lot of U.S. history, government, economics, kind of the same. I think ethnic studies is different in that you are. It's very personal. Um, when you're talking about World War II, it's less personal to the kids in the room right in that moment. You know, for some of them more than others, but really they're not all like feeling it. When you're talking about culture, when you're talking about race, and when you're talking about immigration. It is deeply personal. And uh, so your sensitivity to the subject matter, your language, every word that comes out of your mouth cannot be accidental. Uh, it has to be very intentional and you have a lot of little like vulnerable hearts in front of you. So you have to be very careful without, uh, without, um, um, putting, without making them seem fragile. Like they are not fragile. They are, they are not, you know, they are pretty sturdy kids. So you have to like always do this thing between like you're not, you know, you're not they're not too fragile, but you're also really sensitive and being careful. Um, so I think ethnic studies lends itself to to having to have a real awareness of that. And at Berkeley High, we do not hire just anyone for ethnic studies for this reason, because it can't just be anyone. If you're a white person teaching ethnic studies, you got to be such a such a deep thinking white person. You have ha you have to have done your work. If you have not done your work, you're not ready for it. Um, all of us have work to do, not just white people. All of us have work to do. But if you're a white person teaching ethnic studies, you have more work to do. And if you don't know that and recognize that, then you can't go out of the gate because it's too dangerous for the kids in the room. It's really dangerous. You could actually do some real damage. And I haven't felt that way teaching government. I don't really feel like I could do as much damage teaching government as I do with ethnic studies. Um, and then the advice I would give, um, my best advice to new teachers is always about shoes. I know that sounds ridiculous, but <laughs> really, like, you can't spend money on a lot of things as a new teacher because, you know, your salary is not wonderful. Uh, but it's the one thing you should always spend money on is your shoes because it is, your feet are the only thing that are going to get you there. And you're not going to be a sitting down teacher. You're going to be a moving teacher and a walking around teacher. And you need good shoes to do that. So spend money on shoes. Shop at Ross for everything else, but spend money on good shoes. Um, ethnic studies teachers, do your work. 
that's your responsibility. It's your job to understand your privilege. If you're straight, do your work on your straight privilege. If you're white, if you're a man, whatever your privilege are, whatever your entitlements are, do your work before you come into the classroom. You don't want to put it on the kids. It's not fair for them. Um, all right, that's it that's in a, not a nutshell, I know. And if I can jump on yeah. um, from the jump middle school on. perspective, I guess. Uh, typical day, as mentioned, eight, there is no typical day. Every day is different. Um, if you happen to love the middle school age and high school too, they will love and hate you all on the same day. And you just got to deal and accept that. Yeah. Um, I think last year and having the opportunity to teach, still teach U.S. history and ethnic studies was it allowed me, one, to find my voice, right? I, working from, I spent most of my time in San Francisco Unified. That's where I'm from. I had, you know, 10 to 12 years there before coming to Castro Valley. Major culture shock. I did not think I was going to fit in because the only complaints that I got or why does my child have an A minus? Mm -hmm. And I'm used to lockdowns at my school or parents coming down angry. That was my, what I, you know, started out with. So working in Castro Valley with, in the U.S. history, or in the history, history department, not just U.S. history, I was the only person of color in history. Everywhere around me was all white, white male, mostly white males, but a sprinkling of white females. So already right there, it was, I knew it was going to be a challenge. Um, and so luckily the cohort of teachers who I worked with, our PLC, they were open to hearing uh, about looking at our U.S. history from a different lens. You know, like let's close that TCI history textbook, you know, that is a lot of districts use. Let, let, let's talk about, you know, as we talk about, you know, a certain time period. Well, what about this group? What about that group? And so it gave me an opportunity to teach, right? To teach a little, well, how, why, how, can you bring in different perspectives that are not in our textbook? You know, kind of that, that decolonizing that master narrative, right? That, that, you know, Takaki talks of because, and now it's ingrained with the current US history teachers. Like when we teach, we're not talking about, you know, exploration and settlement. We're talking about colonization and that you have, you know, displaced and killed off people in stolen land. That's the language you're using. And I know, you know, our kids, you know, even middle school, you might think like, oh, well, they might be too young to understand that. No, you, even us, like our sixth graders, like especially our kids of color, like they've been talking about this stuff like from at home, you know, probably from day one. And so it's just, you know, learning, knowing your community, right? In terms of maybe topics that you are gonna be teaching, but also know like you gotta kind of push them a little bit, right? Even if they have a ton of questions. Um, and in terms of, you know, with the ethnic, the ethnic studies curriculum or for new teachers, it's, it's okay if you don't necessarily get through everything in your lesson. Like, I might have this fabulous unit that I'm working on that is, oh my God, we're going to talk about all these different things. I might get through three of the five things. But you know what? We had the deepest, richest conversation, and that is what they're going to walk away with. So I, I might have failed at, you know, teaching, you know, certain topics but I know it's gonna stick with them. And I think just with, with any good teaching, you gotta be able to reflect on your teaching, right? What worked, what didn't work. Not just the content, but how you're teaching it. It's just constant revision. Everything I did last semester, I've completely changed. So you will be staying up late. Late, a lot. Um, you might get compensated, you probably won't get compensated, right? This is the reality. If you want to be a good teacher, you're going to put in that extra, that extra. Um, so leave that, that. I would just add on too, especially if you're a teacher of color coming in as a new educator, to really find your people mm -hmm. first and foremost to get that sense of community, because most likely, unfortunately, you will be faced with having to deal with racial microaggressions or outright aggressions. <laughs> and have a lot of different um, expectations placed on you. And so just finding your people, finding your community, I think is extremely key and important is definitely what has kept me coming back each year, being in this district 19 years. I could not have done it without my people. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that I've learned is, um, not only as a teacher, but as a parent, is to really stay humble and be able to pause a conversation and say, 
I need to do a little more learning or I need to really stop right now, pause, process, and circle back on this conversation so I can really have my thoughts clear and be intentional in what I wanna say. So being able to pause and circle back has been really powerful for me as an educator and as a mom. And also to be able to be humble and apologize to my students, to my child when I misstep, when I cause harm and be accountable and upfront about that. And that is also what strengthens relationships right, with our students, with our children, with whomever, <coughs> is to be able to be accountable, apologize and um, repair the harm. So I think those things have, have served me well. And um, I think I just wanted to add in the conversation. There was another um, question, if I may. Yeah, yes. one. Um, this question of, let me see if I can find it again. Um, I'm sorry, maybe I lost it. Uh, sorry, I'll come back to you. Sorry, I lost which one it was. Well, I can jump yeah. in for a moment and, and speak to that question of um, specifically what makes ethnic studies <laughs> different than teaching other subjects. Um, having taught U.S., having taught Gov, having taught a number of other history subjects along the way, having taught middle school before I was a high school teacher. So I feel that the sixth and seventh grader love in, in, in a way as well. Um, you're never going to have to teach anything that's going to challenge you as a person to be as self-reflective about what you're seeing and what you are and who you are. Mm -hmm. There's When you're teaching AP Gov, you're never going to have to have as much self-reflection as you're going to have to do on a garden variety day teaching ethnic studies. Like You're going to have to like uh, face yourself, really. You're going to have to face yourself on behalf of your students if for no other reason than you need to model what it looks like to face yourself. <laughs> So that way they can see what it looks like to face yourself and like see and all the things that like you're insecure about and all the things that that you have um, areas that you need to grow and be vulnerable about like you need to, 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 to wrap your head around what it's like to be vulnerable in front of people. Um, because that's we call that Tuesday. <laughs> like, like you're just gonna have to like like become comfortable with that and and everything else that people said like yes shoes yes you're going to be up late you're gonna become a writer whether you think you are a writer or not you're gonna become a writer because you're gonna to need to find a way to express a complicated concept in a way that is accessible to people who have varying degrees of of willingness to be able to want to know or, or be ready for what you have to say to them so that's it's going to to challenge the 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 creative pieces of yourself that maybe you haven't realized you have yet but they're going to be in there because you're going to need to summon them and you will um that's that's just a part of this um to new teachers at this i mean i i think that just teachers in general uh, a, a really good practice is um there are some teachers that will tell you to not get too close to your students um to not know too much about them to kind of like keep like a reserved distance and I understand why why that that works for some. Um, I think that that doesn't work for this particular discipline. For this discipline, you you kind of have to be the teacher that is in everybody's business a little bit. Um, you have to know that such and such's cousin is is here and doing this, and and <coughs> don't say anything about because they're over there. They're, you like all the politics. You will be in teenagers' lives in a way that you weren't expecting. Like, why do I know this much about this teenager right now? <laughs> Because it's Tuesday, <laughs> so that that that's the thing. It's it's be comfortable with with that as like your the way that you're going to be taking on your life now is like you're you're doing all the work as as an adult and as a as not a role model but a model for behaviors because you're going to be as flawed as anybody else, right? You're going to mess <laughs> up and do dumb stuff. Um, they're going to see you do it, and by the way, they probably should too. They should see you be messy also at your also at your best too because that'll teach them to be honest in a way that that you being honest is the only way you could ever show that um but just know that that's that's the kind of life and the kind of experience that you're in for and that doesn't come when you teach ap us history that only comes i mean it can that's not true it can um but you're specifically going straight for the heart of that in this I found the question. All right, it was. Some of the material we learn about slash teach in ethnic studies can be heavy. How do you keep your students engaged and how do you break down concepts? 
So what has always drawn me personally to ethnic studies is that to me, ethnic studies is a love story. It is based in love. It was born out of love, love for community, love for self, love for ancestors, love for centering our stories. And I think when you come from it, come at it from that place, um, it is can be very joyful when you're telling stories around solidarity. That is joyful. That is inspiring. It's healing. Um, so I think just making sure that there's there's always a balance, and um, and you know, like Jason and folks on the panel are saying, really knowing your students, being in touch with them, and even if you have this like badass lesson that you've planned, knowing when you need to pause, make it a little more bite-sized, um, circle up dig into something and those relationships are what are really gonna um, take you where you need to go with your class community and I think just following the lead of your students and, and knowing them well you'll be able to do that um, and I think too you know because I'm coming from the elementary landscape um, you know with older students, you're really focused on their relationships with the students and maybe not so much with the parents, but with, with the babies, really doing um, family interviews early in the year, making sure um, you're getting to know caregivers as, as much as you possibly can so that you have a strong relationship with the family unit and you're really in touch with what's going on. Um, of course, having those strong relationships with the babies too, but really making sure you're having those opportunities to connect with the families and um, be able to set up your classroom for success, um, be able to give information to families ahead of time so they know what's going on, you know, the newsletters, all of that is so appreciated. Families really do read those things. They, we want to know, like as a parent, we want to know what's happening in our, our children's classrooms. So making sure that you're having really open, honest communication with families. I think at all levels is really important, but particularly at elementary, if you're bringing ethnic studies, pedagogy into your classroom and content, um, you wanna make sure the families are really looped in. And, and I think ultimately what I found as an elementary teacher who really did bring ethnic studies into my classroom, many of the years I was teaching it was super supportive. I mean, lucky that I'm in the Bay, so it's a little bit of a unique context. It certainly did get pushback, but overwhelmingly, I had a lot of support because there was just a lot of communication, a lot of um, relationship building opportunities for families to be in the classroom, see what was going on, experience it firsthand. Um, so yeah, just bringing it back to the relationships for sure. And then I'll just add on to the student engagement piece. Um, I think bringing in your own personal experiences is huge. Like we could be talking about, you know, microaggressions. Kids are like, what is that big word, right? But you can start giving examples of them. Like, oh, okay, I heard so-and-so say it in another class, right? But if I'm giving my own personal experiences. I see they're moving a little bit closer, right? Because, oh, most teachers don't really talk to us about that aspect of their personal life, right? They might say, oh, things I like to do and everything, but not like, oh, you know, I was made fun of for not being able to speak Spanish, but you're like, there were all these different things, right? They're like, oh yeah that happened to me too I'm like okay let, let's keep talking about it right and again that also that parent piece you know you're not going to have a traditional maybe homework assignment right it might be all right i'm going to email home this is the video we watched in class i want you to talk to your parent your family um hope your family unit is what we talked about in class and have a conversation and then you're going to report back what that conversation was like and it was like a mix of things right you had some families who were like I'm not allowed to talk about that. I'm like, okay, thank you for letting me know. Or if they, some family were like, oh, we talk about this on a daily basis. So it gives you more insight as to you know where your um, your kid your kids are coming from, right? Because some are at different levels. I want to take a second to respond to one of these questions. Um, so someone wrote on this list of questions from the the submission: How you manage the backlash that you might <laughs> receive from parents and or communities about ethnic studies in classrooms? Is somebody here ask that question? No. There are a couple different versions of that same question. Yeah. Parent, yeah. You know, parent community backlash. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that because it comes up enough uh, a couple times, it's worth talking about in this space. So um, the job that I have here at UC Berkeley is I go to a lot of different schools throughout the Bay Area and help them to sort of foundation 
create foundations for their ethnic studies program. And uh, most times, you know, it is the Bay Area, so you have a lot of schools like, oh, well, I took as teachers, I took ethnic studies, or, or we've had ethnic studies here for a year, so we've done some of this work already. But there's other communities in even the Bay Area where ethnic studies is uh, a foreign concept and an unwelcome concept. Mm -hmm. And not everybody uh, in this space is going to work in education in the Bay Area. So as you move out for, further okay. away from, from our city centers and you're, you're going to places where maybe some of you grew up, where ethnic studies isn't a thing like it is in San Francisco or Oakland or, or San Leandro, that it's going to be a, a more of a reality for you to sort of na negotiate those, those politics of it. Um, there's, there's always a, a, a new phrase or a new sort of term to sort of to describe whatever like the pushback is to, to sort of anti-racist teaching. That's sort of like something that, that you can kind of almost count on year in, year out. Is like, like the last year was critical race theory. Before, like, oh, Lord knows. But there's always like a thing. Um, but the thing is, there's always going to be a thing. So get ready for the fact that this is going to be a part of the, the role that you as an educator of ethnic studies is going to be, uh, it's going to be part of what you're doing is being able to speak to these things. Um, I, I wanted to share, um, the, the, the line that we, what we asked the teachers to sort of take on and also my own personal experience with this. Um, the line really is that, that you want to make sure that, um, you are you're well um, well able to articulate what ethnic studies actually is, uh, as opposed to what folks might believe it may be. Um, kind of be there to show the foundations of why ethnic studies needed to happen and why it continues to need to happen. Be able to speak to that, because I think that in most places, um, regardless of whatever your political bent is, folks can agree that not everything feels okay. Like things just to like, like, ever, like people are upset. People that just things don't sit right with their, wherever you are on, on whatever your belief structure is, there's something that just doesn't feel right. And like, there's something that, that we all want to speak to, like to address that, that sort of an ill at ease thing that we have when we look at the world. And this is just an effort to try and get to the heart of that. And what, and what a great thing to do at school to not run away from the fact that, yeah, like things don't, things just don't feel right all the time. And so this is just us at school looking at that and as uh, again i don't have kids but I, I would want for my kids to have that right I, ha I had 180 kids every year so but i wanted them to have that to have that moment it's like all right so it's like we're not like we're not going to pretend like this, this isn't happening and so that there's freedom in saying we're, we're addressing the thing that we all know is happening and and we can debate how we do that we can debate what's brought up and where we bring it and, and all these things. And, and that's that's fair. And that's why we convene community to be able to talk about what's in our ethnic studies class. So we can talk about how we're going to talk about the thing that doesn't feel right. Um, but just be able to articulate it on, on your terms in that way. Um, but real quick, my story around this, um, I taught in East Oakland. So I didn't have a lot of, of conservative parents saying, don't teach a very uh, homogeneous white or any like sort of group like our community, um, there's a different kind of, of pushback that can happen for your ethnic studies course. And my story is a little bit of a garden variety one of those. Um, I taught in my ethnic studies class uh, a, a, a number of lessons, but a particular lesson around um, systems of oppression. And an example that we did in a very uh, a very thoughtfully, I hope, was presented uh, lecture was about um, the life and death and the family reaction of Emmett Till. And so I taught that to my students. And in that class, because we had done the work to get us there to have this conversation, uh, if you know the picture, you know the picture, right? And so, I went, like, so what you're about to see is is something that's gonna that's gonna sit with you, right? So I just need you all to be ready for that. And we shared that moment where, where the, 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 the gasp sort of happens and that the whole, the, that, that, that sort of reckoning like, all right, this is like the real world, this is what we're, we're looking at. And, you know, the, the students got sent home after, after having a conversation around that in class, and I got a call the next day from a parent. And that call was from a, a parent of a kid, um, and, and their family had just moved to Oakland from Alabama. 
and there was like we literally and the friend parent and he was literally said we literally left there so that way we wouldn't have to look at that part of my language or use his language that ugly shit anymore. We are here because we don't want that shit. And I had to sit with the principal, this parent, and then in a room as he says that 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 makes sense. I get you. Um, one thing that I didn't do that when I look back and I think about like the way that I should have handled that original instruction um, that I always encourage like, so teachers to absolutely can do is to make space for something difficult that you're going to share with your students and you're going to share something difficult with your students. Make space for that community. You, you, like, you, at the end of the day, they, you're still dealing with teenagers. You're still dealing with kids. You're still dealing with students of like, all kinds of ages, right? You need to get their hearts ready for what you just gave to them. Um, I, I, I justified showing that that, that photo to the camera saying, you know, like, his mom like, put that mag that photo in the magazine, in the jet magazine, so people could see it. That, that was that was kind of her wish, so I, I'm doing my best to sort of live up to that. And that felt sort of hollow in the moment, but I think that if I had done a little bit more work around like the aftermath of that, what that meant for people, how how it sat with everyone, that would have maybe went home a little bit different and caused a little bit of a different conversation. So think about the impact of the things that you're sharing, the experience that you're that you're creating for your students in the ethics studies class, um, how they're gonna resonate and and how that will create or not create backlash in whatever form it takes. The things that you're gonna share with those kids that, that will be um, it's, it's sometimes the first time in school that anyone ever talked about them or their family, right? It's the first time a teacher would like to talk about you, maybe in your ethnic studies class. What that experience is like, it can be great, it can also be really fun. So like, you have a, a, a responsibility in that moment to handle that. There's one question. Hmm. What was the race of that family? African American. It's so, like, such an interesting story. Yeah. Maybe we do this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's such an interesting story because this is exactly the kind of thing that comes up in our ethnic studies teacher conversations. There's seven of us at Berkeley High who teach ethnic studies. And if you had brought that as like a teaching dilemma, oh, it would have been fun to chop up. Because I think a lot of folks who would have agreed with that parent would have said, uh huh, it is not appropriate, especially if you're not a black teacher, to to bring that image, not knowing how it lands with particularly black students, right? Um, this comes up around our immigration unit all the time because we have this essay question uh, that was, we had an essay question in uh, ethnic studies uh, a few years ago. It was something like, was it, you know, like, we're really careful, we try really hard not to treat questions of things like deportation that are like us just sort of positing or pondering somebody else's fate, essentially, right? Um, because it seems really insensitive to the person who's actually experiencing that in the room. Like, oh, I think it was like, you know, a debating um, DACA or debating Trump's border wall or something like that, which is, which is damaging and harmful. And so like on the one hand, you want to give kids the tools to debate. On the other hand, to say that it's even a question that that would be a humane way to go, kind of, you have to really, you, you know, you have to ask yourself, is that the question you really want to give 14 and 15 year olds to treat? Knowing that some of them, one of them is gonna step in it, right? And say something insensitive or inappropriate and then you, as the teacher, are responsible for holding the feelings in that room, just like you, right, were responsible for the reaction. Now, that kid didn't have, let's say, an external reaction in the classroom, maybe, and that, I don't know if they did or didn't, that person, they went home and told their parents. But I have been in rooms where I have, you know, taught U.S. history, the lynching photos are some of the most classic ones, right? Where for years, it was like, yeah, if you're talking about lynching, you're going to show lynching photos not realizing that that lynching photo will have a really deep impact, a different impact on uh, an African-American student than anyone else in that room. So if the next period, that kid gets into a fight with someone in school, right? They get into a fight, they get suspended. It takes days to figure out what happened to that kid, which is that they sat in a class, 
where they had to see photos of them, their people being lynched, right? Now, does that mean we never show Emmett Till? Does that mean we never show pictures of lynching? I don't know. But these are the exact conversations you have to have as a school community with your trusted colleagues before you ever put that material in front of the kids. Like, this is what we're talking about. If you really, you have to be really responsible for this material. It's not like, just because I learned it, I have to teach it to other people, right? It's that I learned it, and now I have these very 14, 15 year old teenage developing brains, or you know, from third grade to, to ninth grade. And I have to, you know, I can't all treat it differently. So in our ethnic studies department, we actually like some of our teachers are, are more comfortable with certain material than others, right? Based on their own identity, how the student view that. Right, and the safety and comfort that they built around that particular curriculum or that content in, in the work. You know, but that's just kind of what you're saying. Reflection, years of experience, sitting down with a parent being like, oh, right, didn't realize how that might land with that kid. How could you know? How could you know? You can't know it all. Yeah, and the things that you actually have to do and go back and, yeah. and, and reckon with yourself and like right. your choices and like, and would I do that again? How would I do that again? If I did that again, yeah. was that worth it? Like this. That's part of the, the complication of teaching this course, which is why, and this was brought up earlier, like the one of the, the scariest thing about for me about ethnic studies becoming your graduation requirement in high school is, yeah. is that who are all the teachers that can be taking all this work and how yeah. will you be able to have that conversation? I don't know that they all are. I know for a fact that they all aren't. Because I'm going to all these schools, I'm just like, which one, which which the person in this room is going to be going to this class. So, yeah, yeah there's got to be like something that he's like, right? I mean, like, there's got to be something that's a little more. Not every teacher can handle every curriculum. Yeah, and, and, and that is like, again, this is this is why this isn't the econ. Like, there's, yeah. there's choices that you have to make here when you're doing this part that just don't exist in your own structures. The other interesting thing about curriculum, and I don't know if you guys have seen the movie Precious Knowledge. Do you guys know the film Precious Knowledge and the story behind it? Yeah. Arizona and Arizona, Texas and Arizona. Yeah. It's really important. Yeah. So the the um, you know we show our kids Precious Knowledge, which is the sort of the, sh the story of what happened to ethnic studies in in this one high school in Arizona, right? And the you know this the the one of the representatives that's against the ethnic studies program at this high school comes to visit the high school, the ethnic studies class, and our students are always like our ethnic studies class doesn't look like that right like our kids in Berkeley, and so we're always like reminding them and this is to some of the curricular questions you guys were asking. So like, if you're in Arizona, and you're teaching ethnic studies to a group of primarily and only Chicano, if you're a Chicano Latino man and you're teaching ethnic studies to a group of Chicano Latino students, your curriculum looks very different than my curriculum in a ninth grade department where 40% of my students are white, 13% of my students are African American, 20% of my students are you know Chicano Latino, 18% are mixed, I don't know, have I reached 100? Probably. Five, six percent are Asian. I mean, you're not teaching, you're not teaching what he's teaching. Right, so your context really matters. And in our ethnic studies classes, we start with the basics. We're like, what is ethnicity, right? And the white kids immediately go, I don't know, I don't have an ethnicity. Wrong, you do. That's race, we'll talk about race separately. You also have one of those. I know you don't think you do, but you do. Like, so we really have to start with the basics, right? So it's not just the like uplifting, I mean, one of you asked, like, is this the like, African American, Native American, Chicago Latino, Asian American, is it that story? Some of it is, but if you're teaching, like we were saying earlier, in a primarily Armenian community, you're teaching my people in Glendale, California, and 80% of your kids are Armenian, you better have something in there about Armenians, because that's who you're teaching to, yeah. right? And, and if you're in Berkeley, you better talk about white privilege and white supremacy. You know, because you can't teach ethnic studies without understanding, like, who's in front of you. So the first thing we do are these cultural presentations, where kids have to do an ethnic cultural presentation. And you know who it's hardest for, right? It's hardest for the white kids. They're like, I don't have an ethnicity. I'm like, yeah, you have DNA, you have an ethnicity, <laughs> you know? And it takes, it's such a struggle. You know, and I get emails, I should actually pull one of them up and email it to, read it to you guys. It's like, from these white families who are, 
So they're not, no one's like denying that their kid has, they're like, my kid is crying on the floor, crumpled in a ball, because he doesn't think he's interesting, because three generations ago he was Swedish, <laughs> you know, they don't know anything about being Swedish, we were farmers in Arkansas, I mean, they're just like, they don't know, they're not, you know, their friend, their ethnic friends are all like coming with their like, you know, day of the dead, and they make fun of and they're like, they have culture, we have nothing, we're nothing, you know, so like, we have to go through this whole thing where, like, you all were, you know, Italian people were not considered white when they first got here, right? You're only two generations out of that. Like, Irish people, are you kidding me? They were so discriminated against. Them. You know, so, like, really to try to, not to make them feel like they're all victims, but to say, no, like, all of you got here at some point. At some point, you are not welcome. You know, well, some very little piece of you were. But, like... You all brought something to this country. What did you bring? What do you think you brought? You know, and we got some cool presentations like German pretzels. Right? These kids were like, I don't know, I found out I'm German, so I learned how to make pretzels. You know, and they like <laughs> learned the history of pretzels, and they're like, Oh, look at me, I make pretzels now. Uh, and one kid was like, I'm Norwegian. I didn't realize I was Norwegian. I just found out I was Norwegian from four generations ago, and this explains why my family always wants to be on time because people there are always on time, and we're so always on time. So like. Maybe that's my Norwegian roots. You know, they're like, who knows if it is or isn't, but like, they're like trying to make connections, right? Um, so all that is to say, like, it, you know, they don't have to do that in Precious Knowledge. They don't have to do that in that Arizona class. They can skip right to the like, why we're powerful, why we matter, where we are represented. Yeah, where we were oppressed, but where we fought back, <laughs> right? So your context really matters and your own identity, the skin you're in matters so much. You know, um, and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the work. Wait, what did you guys want to say about curriculum? Um, I was going to jump in about um, when you were trying to talk about MSL and just, you know, yeah, that's actually on deck for tomorrow. Yeah. Um, um, but what's so <coughs> even though we're still in our very beginning stages, like the high school has not, um, they're developing their curriculum in eighth grade, we are in our, you know, me, my second, me, the second year, but the other um, eighth grade teacher is in our first year. And what we are doing is um, we have an ethnic studies curriculum advisory, advisory committee that is made up of com community members from different, um, we have parents, we have students, we have content experts um, from various disciplines. Um, and so basically, you know, all the curriculum, you know, that we're teaching, you know, there is no closed door concept, right? Like, oh, I'm closed my door, I'm gonna teach this, that, yeah. like, nope, that does not happen with ethnic studies. If you want the support and backing of your community, you gotta be really transparent. Mm -hmm. I took my syllabus, there you go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in listing of the syllabus, it had all the different concepts that we were going to talk about. Um, so I think that that transparency um, from day one, has helped with not having so much of the backlash um, from families because it's it, it's there, you know. Um, and I think just with the constant uh, you know, communication, like it was a you know draft curriculum, like it constantly has to be a draft curriculum, right? Mm -hmm. You teach the needs of your community, you know. Um, in Castro Valley, it's a very big mixed population, you know. So as we're putting together like an Asian American unit. But we have a high percentage of mixed Asian and something else, or multiracial, biracial. And so we have a unit that's specific to that that other schools might not have in their ethnic studies. But it's just addressing, you know, who's in front of you. And you don't know what mix of kids you're going to get. I was lucky my very first year teaching it, I had the unicorn class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had all kids of color. Never happened before. Wow. Right? Did you have said in Castro Valley? Castro Valley. It was a unicorn class because every kid had already been having this conversation at home, right? So I was like, we can go, right? We can jump into these conversations. And, people, and kids were, I didn't have to show video, you know, like, this is what happened to this group of people. Like, I can tell you about my experience, right? That's not probably ever gonna happen again, right? Especially with this new requirement. You don't know who's coming through your doors, right? And so again, like, you're building relationships, but talking to the different communities regularly, so that you can get input. And some of you, not every member of the community really might, might have a true understanding of what ethnic studies is, right? As we talk about curriculum, they might be like, oh, but we want to talk about this or that. I'm like, thank you for sharing that input. 
but unfortunately they might not quite fall into the disciplines that we're, we're teaching, but we're listening, right? We're listening to their, their suggestions, their ideas. Yeah, I would just jump in and say, um, at Berkeley Unified, we have a pilot curriculum going for third graders, and uh, it's identity focused, um, and it kind of starts with self-identity, um, your classroom community, school community, um, learning about um, indigenous Ohlone communities, and then um, the Berkeley community and some like Berkeley role models. So it kind of goes from self and then ripples out. So that's the design of the unit. And the unit about learning about, um, you know, Ohlone peoples and colonialism is a lot for third graders. So in our team of piloting teachers, we've been talking about uh, just having that dialogue with students about self-care and like, this is an intense topic. And you, if you need to opt out and take a break, you don't want to look at these images, you have that right and you can step into the hallway and I'll, you know, teacher will let you know when we're done with those images and you can come back in. So it's also just, you know, something to perhaps think about um, and to dialogue about with your team. Um, and then just going back to the backwash conversation, I would say because, again, as a teacher of color who was very noisy and advocating loudly for our communities of color and having these topics in our schools, I got a lot of personal backlash. And so something I had to make sure to do was have conversations with my principal, see if we were on the same page so that any messaging um, that I had to respond to um, wasn't necessarily always coming just from me, but it was coming from the institution of the school. Um, that was very helpful. Um, or it was coming from the grade level team, so it wasn't just individualized. And like, if this is just personally coming from me, the teacher, but you know, there's a larger group or institution kind of backing um, the thing, you know, the communication. And then the other piece is, um, you know, we're lucky we have a strong teachers union, but I made sure I was, you know, in touch, connected to my rep at my school site. I knew what my rights were. Um, if any issue came up with administrators or parents, I always touched base with my union rep. Um, and that was a very important relationship for me um, when these kind of uh, moments arose, and they probably will. For you. So, um, those would be two concrete pieces of advice I want to offer. Yeah, I was going to say because we want to honor the fact you've been teaching all day and we want to get you uh, home and hopefully not up all night preparing for the class <laughs> tomorrow. But um, we've got 15 minutes for some questions that haven't been asked and answered. So, do you want to just share, put a hand up, people can call on you? Keep sound? Yeah. Um, how would you navigate a space where you don't have like the backing of your principal or like, um, like the environment? Mm -hmm. I, for me, it was um, just having connections from um, other school sites, so those relationships, um, people from my program. So I just had all these people to like, consult with and talk with and brainstorm with um, so that I didn't feel so isolated. Um. Yeah, I mean, um, I can speak that a little bit. Uh, a lot of the work we do is with supporting teachers who are in a lot of different places, a lot of different spaces. Um, I think the key is to uh, make as broad as possible the network of ethnic studies educators that mm -hmm. are out there that you can call on mm -hmm. to ask, like, hey, what do I do when, or what's going on? Because while, while not, not everybody teaches ethnic studies in Oakland or Berkeley or San Francisco, it's people are teaching in different places, there's going to be different responses. And yeah, there's 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 folks out there. Um, I, I, I've created like a, a social media group for ethnic studies, K-12 teachers, so just so they'll have someone to ask a question to, right? Like that, that's that, that's the thing, like find those, lean on those. I would also say just real quick that um, when you're starting out in teaching, you need to find a place that is a good fit for you. Mm -hmm. I think it's fine to go to a place that's gonna be a little gritty and edgy for you. 
like five years into your teaching career, but it's very challenging to start in a school where you're going to have all these other battles. It's hard enough your first two years. You want to be somewhere where you can find your people, like these guys are saying, and like really you're in a place that's got good new teacher support, that you'll have some colleagues around you, and that there's already something in place um, so that you can get your feet on the ground. Then if you want to branch out to be places like that, to be in a place that might be a little bit more uh, challenging, that's fine. But I wouldn't necessarily start in teaching if you want to sustain it for a long time in a place that's going to be that much of an uphill battle. And I would say I was in a school site so <clears> that <throat> I did not have the backing of the principal. It really took a massive toll on my emotional, spiritual, yeah. and physical health. Mm -hmm. And I had to be brave enough to walk away. Even yeah. though I have deep ties to that community, to those families, teachers, it's really hard to walk away. I taught there 10 years, but I had to do it just for self-preservation yeah. and to be in a community that was much more loving and supportive. And I'm so happy mm -hmm. I made that choice. Yeah. And I'll say that the fact that I saw a lot of hands go up that there, you are, a lot of you are in, in all of the studies majors, yeah, um, mm -hmm. or you know, in the in the disciplines that you guys are going to be the unicorn right now. There are so few of us with an ethnic studies background. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the only one in my district with an ethnic studies background. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Um, <laughs> and so, I mean, in terms of looking for a place that's a good fit. Yeah. What? Who? When did this ever happen? Where you're an ethnic studies major and you can shop around. That doesn't ever happen. <laughs> no, it sounds crazy. It sounds crazy. But I'm already, you know, I'm working with our director of inclusion <coughs> and equity, and I'm like, my, I'm pushing her. It's like, we need to look into ethnic studies programs at the different nearby colleges. We need to have some, I don't even think the word, bringing in. <laughs> oh, it's been a long day. You know, they were grooming. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> But you know, actual recruitment, so that there's a pipe, pipeline, not yeah. the bad one though. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like we, like there needs to be that relationship with, you know, at the ethics studies department, with the current actually program maybe here at Cal, or you know, just there needs to be that to so we don't lose you. <laughs> we are needed. Yeah. I think mine is kind of like a two-part question. So. I'm born and raised in Oakland. I didn't find out about ethnic studies until community college and I had a six year break from high school mm -hmm. into college. So my first question is maybe it's more relevant to like elementary, middle school, like just with the way that textbooks are set, how do you go about structuring um, curriculum and like ethnic studies concepts and theories? Um, where there's just kind of that lack of like the baseline textbooks and then my second part question is that I mean I know y'all have kind of gotten into ethnic studies through different ways but I imagine like maybe y'all didn't grow up with ethnic studies in K-12 either so mm -hmm. what does it look like um, being in that field and reimagining like what you think is missing in that curriculum or what you would have liked um, through that experience in K-12? Mm -hmm. I can speak to like the, the textbook part is give up on that. There's 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 no textbook. <laughs> um, if there's there's so there's texts out there that work towards helping you create a framework for an ethnic studies class that makes sense for your community. Mm -hmm. There's it, it's not a resource list and like here's a problem with them. The, the tall grass or any kind of resource. There's there's stuff that's that's there. Um, I I would be very wary of uh, and it's going to be happening soon. You put money on it. Someone's going to be making the tech. Everybody's textbook putting it out there um, because um, if you're doing that, then you're missing a lot of really essential parts of ethnic studies, which is the community focus, which is the, the orientation around the, the, the specific local history that has to be involved in the ethnic studies course. And how do you start to address like community issues and taking action, which is a, a foundational part of ethnic studies, when this could be presented anywhere if you're using this textbook and who knows what it's about and who made it. So that's um, in some way, I think the way that you're structuring your courses, you're looking at ethnic studies frameworks, you're thinking about the pieces that make sense as a discipline for your community, and you're, you're coming up with thoughtful inquiry questions for like the year, for the semester, for the unit, for the, the assignment that you're giving this week and the project that they're doing, asking questions about, and like, 
building courses around like a good question that your students um, could can learn something from the energy you have dedicated to answering it. Yeah, and the texts are the ones that you pull, right? It's they're, they're constantly refreshing, right? That's the thing is that you can't create a textbook on a field that is really growing and changing a lot. There's new authors coming in all the time and you want it, so you're just constantly learning it while you're teaching it. Um, what was your second question? I don't remember. Yeah, I guess about the textbook question, oh, yeah. I guess it was just about like, because you can't rely on the textbooks for right. building that structure. The second part question was just um, as like folks. Oh yeah, what would you want to do from your own lack yeah, of education? Yeah, like how do you, um, from your perspective, <clears throat> like how do you reimagine um, teaching ethnic studies, especially like without, like growing up without having access to that curriculum, like reimagining that and what you needed when you were growing up, or what the community of students that you currently teach. Yeah, I mean, I think you do it from, I think it's less about you, you know, and more about the community you're teaching, right? Like, because those two things are separate. Like, I will, you know, again, it's like part of the work you do, right? Like, what is the thing that I feel like I missed out on? It's similar to what Joanne was saying about parenting. Like, um, you know, there are things that, like, you want for your own child. <coughs> that you know full well you want because you didn't have them. But that's, you know, there's words for that in therapy, and they're not all very good. Um, you know, and you really, you probably shouldn't be doing that, right? You should really focus on, like, what is it that your child needs? So, but you should still kind of work it out with yourself, like, that you never became a softball star, right? And that's the same with your own kids. So, like, your own students. So, you can grieve what you lost for your own identity and for your own development, but that's going to be separate and different from what your students need. And it's important and healthy to keep that boundary. Um, I don't know, that's what I would say. I don't know if you guys have a different Another question? Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to make a comment. Sorry. I just wanted to make a comment because it's really inspiring to be able to see ethnic studies teachers, um, mainly because, like, when people hear ethnic studies, like, it's kind of like, oh, like, what is that? You know, or like, it's a lot of, why are you doing that major? But like, why do you have a passion for it? Um, at least that's what I find. And so for me, in my experience, I I was in high school who I didn't come from ethnic studies teacher, which is why I want to continue the work because it's ethnic studies, the fight ethnic studies is so important. Um, but yeah, it's just really inspiring to see like, faces that they're actually teachers. <laughs> like, teaching ethnic studies. So many of us do. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's so inspiring yeah. to me. So just thank you guys. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. Okay, another question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just gonna ask because y'all spoke a lot about just like doing personal work and uh, bringing like your personal stories into uh, the academic lens. I guess my question is like, as like the lens has evolved and like as like things get like refreshed and like rephrased, like what what kind of work do y'all do personally to make sure like you're showing up like in the correct way, like for your students and like in the process. Therapy. <laughs> I was gonna say therapy. <laughs> therapy is amazing. Um, and just making sure that you are in constant dialogue not only with yourself, but also with colleagues. Yeah. And I think we're all lucky because we're part of the ethnic studies community. It is such a loving, generous, reflective, and transformative community to be a part of. So we are so lucky to be in community together. Mm -hmm. And so being able to have those folks to, to talk about these things with um, before going into those spaces with kids is, is pretty special. Um, and I think for me, maybe not quite therapy yet, um, but more of, you know, finding, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, um, you know, finding, again, like those like-minded souls, yeah. you know, on your campus. But it's also like, and I, I, I'm just making sure if, I'm heard, if I heard the question correctly, kind of like, like how are you walking the talk? So kind of like how you're like you're stepping up, right? Like we get to talk about activism and all this and that. Like, what am I doing to show with my students? As one is, it can be might sound really small, but if you hear kids using certain words inappropriately, oh, I'm on you. You might not even be one of my students, but I'm gonna talk to you, and you're gonna know that you should not be you know, be talking about that or saying that. Not just because it's bad, but let me tell you why. 
So, because we have so many kids who are like, oh, well, the teacher didn't say anything, you know? And that's so much harm that is caused right there when a teacher does not step in, you know, when some another kid has said something to them. So there's that piece, but there's also, you know, like things school-wide, at least, you know, um, we have an advisory um, committee and there's very few of us, very few want to take on the role of, all right, we've got Thanksgiving break coming up. We're not calling it Thanksgiving break anymore. We are telling the school, school wide, that we're calling a fall break. And we are actually going to talk about, you know, what actually happened on Thanksgiving. You know, so, and I tell my students, like, guess who that advisory? Yep, that was me. And I want them to know, right? Because it's like, I'm gonna stand with you guys, you know, and as you guys learn this, and other teachers have to be uncomfortable with it. They're not making it that way. <laughs> uh, for me, I think um, the work and pushing that move forward is uh, really two things. Listen to your students, uh, but don't hear them but listen, and if you understand the distinction, you understand the distinction. Um, but also center your uh, the interaction that you have with those students when you're listening to them, um, and really just rooted in love. Like you're like, like, like center the part of you that is as, that cares for people and like wants to, to, to to see people be at their best and, 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 and do better and, and realize all the things they care about and want to do. You, you can, if you use that as your like compass, your drug star, like the decisions you make about learning more about this specific or that or how you can better support, that's just gonna become natural just because that's just an expression of the fact that I cared about you. So like it's important to you, so I'll make it important to me because I know it's important to you. So like, lead with that part and like the, the rest will just kind of like the, the momentum of that will drag you into the, the path. Yeah, I would just say I read a lot. I mean, I think that part of the way to do the work is to read what's coming out in these fields, you know, and read a variety of authors, a diversity of race and ethnicity, and, you know, sex and gender, sexuality. I mean, really, like, uh, especially read the intersectional authors, the authors that are talking about identity not as like a monolith, but as it, you know, all the kind of complex layers of identity. Um, go to talks, you know, stay scholarly. Um, and I think that's something that is hard to do when you're a teacher because your life is very full and you're in school all day. So, but going to talks and listening and really just keeping your brain refreshed. That's why there's no textbook, right? Because it's the field is changing, the people that are coming into the field. And honestly, young people, I mean, you know, I always, I still feel like I'm 25 years old. I'm not, I'm 46. And the young people coming into our, our profession are really changing a lot of this dialogue, right? Mm -hmm. um, you have that experience? Yeah, well, I, yeah, one of them's in the back. Oh, awesome. Um, <laughs> So y'all are gonna push us to, to yeah. keep doing like like there's gonna be something that you're gonna read or write or an opinion that you're gonna have like make us like we gotta, we gotta do better. Um, do the things you're gonna do like be true to it. You'll 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 force the people who are in a lot of different places yeah. to consider a lot of different things if you just keep your head where it is and just try. This has been amazing. Um, so many questions probably still in the room. Um, you now know each other, right? You all know that you are the ones who are interested in being those teachers. And so hopefully we can connect you all so you can also start to share information and support each other to create that community that has been named so often tonight. But with deep appreciation for what you do day in and day out of the classroom, but also for spending your evening with us tonight. Thank you so much for being here.